So with our final lecture for this course, we're going to look at World War I, uh, though before World War II, known as the Great War, uh, because they didn't know there would be a second one, which lasted between 1914 and 1918. And up until that point, perhaps the most devastating war uh, that the world had ever experienced, certainly that Europe had ever experienced, uh, and in large measure because the technology for waging war had far exceeded uh, you know, uh, what they, they knew about military strategy and certainly in terms of you know, the uh, required medical advances that would allow them to deal with the kind of casualties being created, right? So it would be a very highly mechanized war. Uh, so the top image you see there, the images here are kind of really basically reflecting that. The top image, what's known as no man's land, right? This would have been the territory between the two fronts, between the two opposing armies. Uh, which usually looked like hell on earth, right? Where it was just complete devastation uh, with rotting corpses everywhere, you know, any, any kind of uh, sign of life being completely obliterated, including plants, trees, small animals, and so forth. Uh, so in some ways, a very powerful uh, symbol of how devastating this war was. And again, in large measure because of the mechanized nature of the war, uh, and the fact that in terms of strategy, they, they really hadn't kept up, right? So probably most important would have been the machine gun, which you see in the lower left-hand corner. But you'll note that the guy there is also wearing a gas mask, right? So chemical warfare is going to be a major aspect uh, of, of why the war is so devastating. Uh, we see the beginnings of ironclad ships in the Navy, uh, the beginning of tanks, which you see there uh, in the center right, and then finally the, the first... Uh, fighter planes, right? Uh, though that might have been the, the one uh, kind of engagement during the First World War that would maintain a certain kind of romanticism uh, with it. Now, I should note, at the beginning of the war, uh, many Europeans almost eager to fight and really had a very romanticized notion about uh, what war was about. And that would very quickly become dispelled by this conflict. There was just nothing really romantic about mowing down or being mowed down by machine guns in the in the thousands right uh and certainly you know uh, sleeping in trenches watching friends of yours be completely uh you know blown up uh you know the fact that very often people died very painful deaths because you know again they didn't have the medical capability to deal with certain kinds of wounds that later on even during the second world war uh, would probably not prove fatal uh, so a very brutal war now, of course, when we talk about something as uh, impactful as the First World War, uh, you know, very often with this kind of thing, we do have a, an idea that there was some kind of immediate cause. And probably most of you are aware there was some guy who was assassinated, and that's often presented as the thing that started the war. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but really, you know, uh, someone being assassinated, a political figure in and of itself, that is not going to be enough to start a war. Uh, that kind of thing happens all the time. So in order to really understand why that event would trigger the war, you need to look at the long-term causes, right? These kind of broader causes that uh, reflect developments that were taking place uh, often for decades, if not even longer, in the period leading up to the war. So when we talk about the causes of the First World War, there are a number that most historians uh, agree with. There is kind of a consensus about certain long-term causes. One is increased colonial competition, right? That uh, you had the uh, various European states were creating these huge colonial empires, increasingly butting heads. And related to that, there was a genuine concern about this new superpower that had been created at the end of the 19th century or towards the end uh, in the center of Europe, Germany, which was seen as posing a threat to the balance of power. And that became a major factor uh, driving an alliance between Britain and France. Both felt very uh, threatened by Germany. Uh, and a lot of that played out with respect to their colonial uh, empires, right? So this kind of colonial competition. Now, related to that, if we consider, you know, why are the European states acquiring colonies very often for raw materials and markets? Uh, a related factor is growing commercial competition. Uh, and, you know, here, particularly, uh, again, Germany is going to be, uh, you know, kind of a major factor here, because in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, Germany, along with the United States, are emerging as important industrial powers. Uh, so the British in particular see that as a threat. Uh, during the early part of the Industrial Revolution, they had clearly dominated. So that's changing. 
A third factor would be the growth of nationalism. And there are two aspects to this, uh, right? So first of all, uh, you know, nationalism in the sense of patriotism. Uh, everyone is very feeling very patriotic. They're actually putting pressure on their governments to go to war. Everyone feels that their country has the best army, is the strongest, is the most righteous. So every time there's an issue with another country, uh, there's kind of this sentiment or sensibility, why resolve it diplomatically? We have the better army, we're in the right, uh, we should settle this via war. You know, that kind of couples with a romantic, romanticizing of war, right? So where that doesn't seem like such a bad option. Uh, so patriotism, but also nationalism in the sense that uh, increasingly people are identifying as part of this or that nation. And you have a lot of multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic empires. Uh, and with, with respect to Europe, a very important one would be the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, where you have a lot of ethnic groups uh, living in the empire who are very dissatisfied, right? They, they want to have their own state. Uh, based on the fact that they constitute a particular nation. Uh, and so that is, you know, going to create a lot of pressure within these multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic empires. And finally, uh, another factor we have kind of internal strife, uh, often associated with kind of working class movements, socialist labor movements, right? So one way political figures deal with that, this kind of growing division between uh, poor working class people and wealthy upper middle class and above people, is by distracting them, right? You know, kind of like using nationalism, using uh, kind of foreign policy as a way of diverting attention away from domestic disorder, uh, which by the way is a major reason why, for instance, Karl Marx, when he was advocating communism, you know, really tried to promote, promote the idea that, you know, being part of the working class means being part of an international group, right? Like what matters is not that you're German or French, what matters is that you're part of the working class and you have a common enemy the bourgeoisie. Uh, political leaders, you know, conversely, would promote the idea that, no, what really matters is that you are German, which puts you, uh, you know, puts you in the same camp as other Germans that belong to the upper, you know, bourgeoisie uh, in opposition to, say, the French, regardless of whether working class or bourgeoisie. Now, one other factor that I devoted an entire slide to, because it's really a pretty significant one, would be militarism, right? So in the period leading up to the First World War, particularly after 1900, you're going to see uh, a, a tremendous growth in mass armies, right? Brought about by conscription, right? By 1914, most Western countries are drafting every able-bodied young man to serve in the army. Really, the only two exceptions at that point are the United States, which, as we're going to find out, doesn't get into the war until much later, uh, and Great Britain, which, as you might recall, uh, in connection with our discussion of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the British have a tremendous navy, but they had developed a practice of subsidizing other countries' armies to fight for them on land. So they don't have a really big army either. Uh, but they're going to make up for that once the war gets going. Uh, but, but most other states in Europe have these huge armies. And, and the problem is you have a huge army, you have a problem with another country. The temptation to use that army is pretty strong. Russia has an army of 1.3 million men by 1914. The French and Germans, 900,000 each. Right? So again, you have an army. It's like, why not use it? Uh, we should note that with growing militarism, military leaders are going to start to have much greater influences in their respective countries with respect to foreign policy. Right? So increasingly, you have decisions being made for military rather than political reasons, right? Like military leaders are coming up with, with strategies about you know, how to win the war if there's a war. Uh, and sometimes that might hinge on uh, who you attack and when. And you know, therefore later on, the, political, uh, the, political, the best political choice might be to not attack someone or to wait for something else to happen. But that might go against what the, the military leaders had come up with with regard to strategy. And in fact, we're going to see how that plays out in the chain of events that actually lead to the First World War. And then finally, that brings us to the last factor, alliances. Right? So one very uh, important factor in the period leading up to World War I are going to be the various defensive alliances that take shape, uh, starting with the end of the 19th century, but kind of uh, accelerating 
in the period uh, leading up to the First World War, right? So in connection with all this kind of military, commercial, and colonial competition, this concern about the balance of power, uh, it becomes increasingly common that countries are making alliances with other countries, usually defensive alliances, right? And it's really important to stress the whole point of a defensive alliance, right, that another country isn't obligated to declare war unless you're attacked, right? To give an example, if you have a defensive alliance between France and Britain and France attacks Germany, Britain would not be obligated to do anything. On the other hand, if the Germans were to attack France, uh, based on that alliance, on that agreement, then the British would be obligated to declare war on Germany. Uh, and so I think it's not too hard to understand how if you have many of these defensive alliances across Europe, uh, as soon as two countries go to war, it's very quickly going to draw in many other countries who have an obligation uh, to defend you. So, you know, at this point, we might highlight what some of these alliances are. Probably the most famous is the Entente Cordiale between Britain and France, which ironically initially was not a defensive alliance at all. It was essentially a mechanism of consultation for resolving colonial disputes. So... Uh, as you might know from the, uh, from, the, from the textbook reading, you know, at one point the British and French almost came to blows uh, in the Sudan as they were both expanding their empires and kind of ran into each other. And they were able to avoid this at the end. They negotiated a settlement. But then they, they, they thought to themselves, wouldn't it be a good idea if periodically the military leaders of both our countries met to discuss colonial claims and resolve them over the table, right? Negotiate a settlement and thus avoid conflict. So that is how it started out. Uh, but over time, both France uh, and Britain became really concerned about Germany, who they saw as threatening the balance of power. Uh, a lot of this really came to a head uh, when the Germans interfered uh, in Morocco with respect to French claims there. Uh, which the British already uh, had had agreed to. Uh, and so in any event, right, well, you know, the basic situation you have is the military leaders of both countries uh, coming together quite frequently uh, in principle to discuss colonial claims, but increasingly talking about the shared threat of Germany, such that the Entente Cordiale eventually evolves into a kind of informal defensive alliance, right? The idea that if, for instance, Germany were to attack France, the British would come to the, uh, France's aid. They would declare war on Germany. And by the way, that political cartoon illustrates the Entente Cordiale. Uh, each individual there, uh, kind of an archetype of their respective country. Uh, you can see France is the, uh, the rather attractively dressed woman. This was often how France would have been uh, depicted in political cartoons as this kind of mistress figure. Uh, the guy who, uh, whose arm she is holding is uh, John Bull, the British Bulldog, and the guy left out in the cold uh, representing Germany. So the British and French have an informal defensive alliance, and alongside of this would be the emergence of a French-Russian defensive alliance, the Franco-Russian alliance. So Russia also felt threatened by Germany's growing power, which led them to form an alliance in 1894 with France. Now, uh, France uh, is still, you know, coming up on the First World War, France is still angry about what happened uh, back in the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, which had led to German unification, but during which France had lost uh, a certain amount of territory, Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, and also had been forced to pay a huge indemnity, right, a kind of reparations. Uh, so it was a ver had been a very humiliating defeat, and they still want revenge. And they also want back Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, and so they're going to, they're more than happy to form an alliance with Russia. The idea that if there is a war with Germany, uh, Germany will now be forced to fight it on two fronts. And obviously, from the German point of view, this is a big problem, very similar to the, the problem that had confronted Frederick the Great and Prussia uh, back during the uh, Seven Years' War. Uh, now, in connection with this, because of the Entente Cordiale, eventually Britain is going to arrive at an agreement with Russia as well. So, you know, now we have Germany smack in the center of Europe with the potential of having to fight a war on three fronts. To the north, you know, if we consider kind of, you know, they're separated by not that much sea from the British against the British. Uh, to the west, France, and to the east, Russia.
So the question we might ask ourselves is how should Germany respond to the Franco-Russian alliance and the, the threat it posed of Germany ending up in a two-front war? Uh, and so first we should note that for much of the 19th century, policy had been guided by Bismarck, and he had considered it uh, one of the uh, chief or one of the main foreign policy goals of Germany should be to do everything to avoid that possibility, related to which Bismarck in 1887 had initiated something called the Reinsurance Treaty with Russia and Austria-Hungary, uh, it being considered that the greatest likelihood of Germany being drawn into a war with, with Russia would be that if those two countries had gone to war and Germany felt compelled to come to Austria-Hungary's defense. Uh, so the basic uh, premise of the Reinsurance Treaty was that all three kind of agreed that if uh, any of the two parties became involved in the conflict, a conflict the third party would stay out. Uh, and, you know, as far as why they felt there was a likelihood of a war between Russia and Austria-Hungary, we'll get to that momentarily. Uh, but, but, you know, for the most part, the reinsurance treaty worked. Problem is, it had to be renewed every five years. Uh, and after Bismarck's resignation, the, uh, at that point, the new Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, basically decided to run foreign policy himself and he's going to allow the treaty to lapse in large measure because he is convinced that based on his personal relationship with the Russian Tsar, uh, who was in fact his cousin, uh, you know, this is a uh, very typical of royalty in Europe during this period. Everyone's kind of related. Uh, most people have some connection to Queen Victoria and so forth. Uh, so he felt that based on that personal relationship, he could avoid a conflict with Russia. And so he allowed the treaty to lapse. And then shortly thereafter, he is going to form an alliance with Austria-Hungary known as the Dual Alliance. Uh, and, you know, you should probably just kind of think about this for a second. He has basically put Germany in the position that if Austria-Hungary goes to war with another country, and, and the likelihood is it would be Russia, uh, then Germany would be required to declare war on whoever Austria-Hungary is fighting. And that would mean Russia, which then, of course, would pull France in, and voila, Germany would be fighting a two-front war. Uh, so arguably not a good combination, right? Allowing the reinsurance treaty to lapse and then forming a defensive alliance with Austria-Hungary. Now Germany would be compelled to go to war if Austria were attacked. And as noted, the likelihood is it would be Russia attacking Austria-Hungary. And a lot of this has to do with the situation in Southeast Europe, known as the Balkans. So by the early 20th century, uh, there's been, uh, we've seen the emergence of a lot of new nation states from what had been the European part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, some of which are ethnically Slavic, such as the Serbs, and on the basis of that, very often strongly supported by Russia uh, with respect to their nationalist ambitions. Uh, and so some of this uh, is genuinely felt. Uh, many Russians feel a uh, kind of a sense of attachment to other Slavic people, uh, and so they kind of, there's a lot of pressure on the Russian government to be supportive of these other Slavic people. Serbs often referred to as Russia's little uh, Slavic brothers. Uh, some of this has to do with foreign policy, that it, it provides a pretext for Russia to become involved in the affairs of other countries. Uh, they can claim they're doing it in order to look out for Slavic interests. They call it, they have this kind of larger ideological movement called Pan-Slavism, which really emphasizes the connection between different Slavic people. Uh, so for instance, that will become a basis for Russia getting involved in Bulgaria when it was fighting for its independence from the Ottoman Empire. They would actually send Russian troops. Uh, so that kind of explains the Russian connection to Serbia. Uh, the Austrians, on the other hand, have a very different relationship with Serbia that is defined largely by the fact that uh, just over the border from Serbia, you have large numbers of Serbs living in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, many of whom wish to be part of a greater Serbia. So by the early 20th century, you have a kind of movement within Serbia supported uh, by many Serbs living in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, that would like to see those territories break away from the empire and become part of a larger Serbian state. Now, you might be thinking, well, I mean, if that, you know, that's what they really want, couldn't Austria, uh, you know, consider allowing them to do that? But the problem from the Austrian point of view is that if they were to allow Serbs in their empire to break away in order to create a greater Serbia, uh, then they would be under pressure to uh, basically... 
uh, acknowledge the nationalist ambitions of various other peoples in their empire, like Czechs, Slovaks, uh, Croats, and then, you know, you have, remember, it's a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic empire with many different peoples. Uh, so basically, uh, the Austrian position is to suppress, you know, the nationalist ambitions of any of the peoples in their empire, and they feel particularly threatened by Serbia. Uh, and so there's always the possibility that at some point they might try to deal with this situation by attacking Serbia, perhaps even absorbing it into their empire, but that very likely could lead to a war with Russia. And in fact, during the early 20th century, the Balkans are uh, really racked with conflict in large measure because when all these new uh, nation states were created, very often there, there, there ended up being a lot of disputes uh, concerning which bit of territory should go to which state. And that will result in two Balkan Wars, the First and Second Balkan Wars. And we don't need to get into the details of exactly how these conflicts played out. Uh, suffice it to say, though, that in neither case did Russia come to the aid of Serbia in large measure because it was really concerned that if they got involved in a war on behalf of Serbia, they might be dragged into a larger conflict with Austria. The point, though, is that by 1914, on two occasions, uh, Russia had failed uh, basically to come to Serbia's aid in, in spite of many pronouncements about how it supported Pan-Slavism, how it was looking out for its fellow Slavic people. So the Russian government is going to be under immense pressure that if Serbia should find itself in a conflict one more time, they really would have to act or else lose face. And all of this is kind of really putting the dominoes in place so that when uh, the, the immediate cause, as is often cited, uh, for the First World War takes place, it basically amounts to somebody knocking down the first domino and then watching them all fall in sequence, uh, with the end result being the First World War. So the immediate event, right, and you've probably all heard this, right, that the thing that started the First World War was the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Francis Ferdinand on June 28th, 1914, by a Serbian nationalist, right? So, you know, this is a pretty serious diplomatic crisis at the time. Austria at this point uh, really feeling that uh, the best way, perhaps, I mean, one very uh, powerful argument being made within government circles is that the best way to deal with the Serbian nationalist issue is simply to go to war and eliminate Serbia. And in fact, Austria accuses the Serbian government of having been involved in the assassination. In actual fact, uh, most evidence would indicate that the Serbian government was not really involved. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Austria looking for a reason to basically come down hard on Serbia. So they issue an ultimatum basically designed to create a pretext for declaring, declaring war. I mean, they actually, the terms of the ultimatum are intentionally so harsh uh, that they anticipate the Serbian government will refuse them. In actual fact, the Serbian government does agree to all the terms, at which point they just start adding new terms, right? Because the whole point really wasn't to have these terms satisfied. It was simply to provide a basis for declaring war. And in the meantime, Germany assures Austria-Hungary that they could rely on Germany's full support in the event that Russia became involved. As, as we noted, Russia will be under tremendous pressure to do. All of this now setting off a chain reaction. The dominoes are beginning to fall. And really my focus here on not just the alliances, these defensive alliances that we talked about that require uh, one country to go to war if another country is attacked, but also the growing influence of the military leaders, right? Because the military leaders have all come up with different strategies uh, regarding you know, what to do in the event of war. Uh, and in some cases, the strategies actually require the country to declare war, even if it might be avoidable. Uh, so for instance, in the case of Russia, the military strategy that the leadership had come up with required complete mobilization of the army in the event of war. Uh, now, some of this had simply to do with the fact that Russia is immense, particularly the Russian Empire, which, by the way, is bigger than Russia. Uh, so it's kind of a recognition that it's going to take weeks to get the, get the army to the fronts. And, and the assumption being that because of the alliance system, that a war with Austria would also mean a war with Germany, that they ought to mobilize against both right from the get-go. Right. So uh, at this point, uh, 
However, it is not entirely clear that Germany is going to be involved. So the Tsar Nicholas II is going to call for a partial mobilization directed solely at Austria-Hungary in the hopes that he might be able to persuade his cousin, uh, uh, Tsar uh, Willy he called him, uh, Wilhelm II, he might be able to convince the Kaiser in Germany uh, to stay out of the conflict. But the Russian general staff, the military leadership, indicates that this is impossible. This is the plan. We have to stick with the plan, meaning that Russia will now mobilize not only against Austria-Hungary, but also against Germany, compelling Germany to declare war on Russia on August 1st. Now, perhaps they would have anyway, but there, at that time, it did seem reasonable to think that Germany might stay out in spite of what they had promised. Okay, so now we have Germany at war with Russia. The big question at this point, and it's not clear, uh, in theory, France should now declare war on Germany as per the Franco-Russian alliance, but it does seem as if France is hesitating to do so. But this is where the German military strategy is going to play a decisive role. So the German military leaders had assumed for some time now that any war with Russia would involve France and therefore would be a war on two fronts. And the military leadership came up with a plan to deal with that called the Schlieffen Plan, named after General Alfred von Schlieffen. And so basically the plan was this, that in the event of a two-front war, the entirety of the German army would be directed at attacking France first, it being understood that it would take probably up to six weeks for the Russian army to fully mobilize. So the idea is if we can take France out within six weeks, right, and they, so they, you know, they, they kind of map out a plan by which they believe they can do that, they would then use their rail system, and the Germans had developed a very uh, efficient rail system primarily designed for uh, military purposes that would allow them to move their army very quickly east and west. Uh, they would then put the army uh, on the trains and ship them out to the eastern front and they would arrive there before the Russians could get there. Right? But the whole thing hinges on taking France out first. Uh, by the way, that would also involve going through neutral Belgium because the French had very formidable defenses on the border with Germany. Uh, so they basically came up with a plan of going around them. By the way, the same thing is going to happen in the Second World War. Uh, and, you know, the idea that uh, they really believed that by kind of circling around and basically surrounding Paris, they could compel France to surrender in a very short period of time and then get to the Russian front uh, in time to meet the Russian army. So based on that, uh, they're going to declare war on France. Now, Kaiser Wilhelm is actually going to suggest to the military that they revise the plan, focus their war effort on Russia, and in the meantime, he would try to keep France from entering the war. But the military leadership is like, no, we have to stick with the plan. So again, Germany declaring war on France on August 3rd, in spite of the fact that uh, there were indications that France might actually stay out of the conflict. Which now brings us to Britain, which on the basis of the Entente Cordiale, in theory, should declare war on Germany uh, because they are obligated to come to France's defense. But in actual fact, there are many within the British government who are hesitating. Uh, the Entente Cordiale, a bit of an informal defensive alliance. Uh, but the thing that will finally decide the British is when uh, the Germans invade Belgium, right? The Schlieffen Plan called for an encirclement movement through Belgium, and on August 2nd, Germany issued an ultimatum to Belgium demanding that it allow German troops to pass through its territory. The Belgians refused, at which point the Germans invaded Belgium in order to get to France. Uh, and for the British, well, this goes all the way back to the Congress of Vienna. It had been considered imperative that under all circumstances, Belgium should remain neutral with respect to any broader conflict, in large measure because Belgium is the closest point uh, on the continent to Britain across the English Channel. If you were going to launch an invasion across the English Channel, you would probably do it from Belgium. And so that will end up deciding Great Britain who declares war on Germany on August 4th. Though we should note there are other uh, kind of deciding factors. Uh, because of the Entente Cordiale, they had actually started, uh, in a sense, had become part of the Franco-Russian alliance uh, with respect to Germany. Uh, and we should note also that kind of rounding out the main uh, participants, uh, 
Uh, shortly after that, the Ottoman Empire will enter the war on the side of Germany. And so basically the battle lines are drawn between the allies, uh, primarily Great Britain, France, and Russia versus the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And at this point, we might just check the map here. You can see in orange the Central Powers, uh, the German Empire, to be more precise, uh, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire, eventually Bulgaria entering the war on the side of the Central Powers. And then in green, the Allied Powers. And as you can see, other European states will eventually enter. Uh, why do other nation states get involved largely? Uh, they side with whoever they think is going to win with an eye towards, you know, maybe getting something at the conclusion of the war. Uh, some of them will actually flip sides like Italy, uh, but it basically breaks down uh, this way. So does the Schlieffen plan work? Remember, the idea was to uh, knock France out of the war in order to be able to mobilize the entire German army against the Russians. And in fact, the, the Germans come pretty close. They come within 20 miles of Paris until finally the French are able to stop them at the first Battle of the Marne, which takes place over the course of several days, September 6th through the 10th. And eventually the Germans are going to have to do what they had hoped to avoid, which is basically to split their military between a Western front against France and an Eastern front against the Russians. Uh, and we should note, early on, they do pretty well against the Russians, right? There they have a number of decisive victories, uh, the battles of Tannenberg and the Missourian Lakes. Um, you know, these take place in August uh, and then also in September. Uh, but eventually, on both fronts, the war is going to become something of a stalemate with neither side able really to make much progress. And probably the thing that the First World War is most famous for are, uh, are these kind of systems of defense that uh, very quickly develop centered around trenches, right? Like, so at some point, there's very little movement taking place. Uh, the war quickly becomes a stalemate. And on both sides, they start digging these, uh, these very extensive trenches, eventually kind of setting up barbed wire uh, in front of them and so forth. And it becomes very difficult for either side to overwhelm the enemy, right? So you have these lines of trenches that at some point are stretching all the way from the English Channel uh, to Switzerland, protected again by barbed wire entanglements. Uh, and in between, you have what's known as no man's land, right? This kind of uh, area of complete devastation, usually a few miles wide, separating the combatants. And it becomes very difficult for either side to really advance on the other, right? This is a new kind of war, and it really has a lot to do with the military technology. And part of the problem is military leaders haven't really adapted to this kind of warfare, trench warfare. So you really end up with this situation where periodically the military command on one side would order masses of soldiers to charge the other side. And these attacks almost never worked in large measure because, you know, on the other side, you have the, the enemy combatants who are kind of, you know, embedded in these trenches with machine guns. And they basically just end up mowing down these masses of soldiers that are running across no man's land uh, trying to take their territory. So every now and then there might be a gain of a few miles, you know, in one direction or the other. But for most of the war, very little movement in this regard and huge, huge numbers of casualties. Right. The number of casualties are staggering. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Just to give you an idea, right, in 10 months at Verdun, for example, uh, where you have uh, where part of the Western Front runs through, 700,000 men lost their lives for the sake of advancing a few miles. Right. Think about that. 700,000 men dead for nothing, essentially. At the Battle of the Somme, the British suffered 57,000 casualties, including 21,000 dead on the first day of the battle. Uh, and again, machine guns are the primary problem, but then we're going to see even other new military technologies, which are only going to make the situation worse. Uh, probably one of the most uh, horrific will be when they start using uh, things like mustard gas, engaging in chemical warfare. And I don't know if any of you know what happens to you if you're hit by mustard gas. It basically melts you, right? So if you're breathing this stuff in, it's melting your lungs. 
very quickly you're going to suffocate. You, have, you know, soldiers with eyelids melting closed. There is a reason why chemical weapons are uh, outlawed at this point internationally, right? They were just too brutal. You know, then later on we're going to have tanks and so forth, uh, just better and better machine guns. And the military leaders are uh, really slow to learn. They just keep basically doubling down on this strategy of just, just trying to have masses of soldiers overrun the enemy. Uh, and again, always the same outcome. And as you might imagine, uh, at the beginning of the war, many, many young men enlisted uh, you know, with great enthusiasm. They, they really had this kind of romanticized idea about what, what the war was going to be like. They will be very quickly dis, uh, disabused of that idea, right? It's not long before uh, you know, the horrors of war. And, you know, not that war isn't ever horrific, but really the First World War, to some extent, unlike anything that had happened before, maybe the American Civil War was a bit of a preview to what was coming in terms of the impact of, uh, you know, machine guns and kind of mechanized armaments. Uh, but, you know, this is really brutal on a whole nother level and really will kind of change the attitude of many individuals about, uh, you know, the, the virtues of war, if you will. So the war is very quickly going to widen. We already talked about how in Europe, many other countries getting involved. Uh, we also noted the Ottoman Empire. You might be wondering, why did the Ottoman Empire get involved? Well, they're hoping to regain territory lost to the Russians, uh, maybe also to push the British out of Egypt, which at one point had been part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, eventually, this you know kind of an interesting side story, but it will have ramifications for the Middle East. Uh, the British are going to deal with the Ottoman Empire uh, in part by promoting an Arab uprising against them. Uh, and this actually to some degree works. Uh, we end up with something called the Arab Revolt that will involve a number of British officers. Uh, probably the most famous is uh, T.E. Lawrence, often referred to as Lawrence of Arabia. Many films made about him. Uh, and this does also become a way of encouraging uh, young men to enlist in the war. Uh, the British don't have a draft initially. I think we mentioned uh, how they didn't have a conscripted army as of 1914. Uh, so Lawrence of Arabia kind of, you know, presenting a more romanticized uh, ideal of what the conflict is like, uh, but obviously very different from the kind of fighting that is taking place on the Western Front. In 1915, uh, Bulgaria, who we already mentioned, entered the war on the side of the Germans. Italy entered on the side of France uh, and Britain. Again, basically, you know, kind of a calculation if... You know, they're on the side of the winner. Uh, at the end of the conflict, they might gain something, probably territory. Uh, the war very quickly spreading to the colonies. The British are seizing German colonies in Africa and Asia. And in fact, the chance of acquiring colonies from Germany becomes a factor uh, in Japan's decision to enter the war on the side of the Allies. They're hoping to gain uh, some of the German-held territory in East Asia and the Pacific. And in fact, they seize those territories. Uh, and probably most interesting is the fact that you're going to see colonials fighting uh, in the army, right? So the British, for instance, a, a large part of the British army is, is going to consist of Indians, Australians, and New Zealanders, uh, particularly with regard to the campaign in the Middle East. Uh, meanwhile, the French are going to draft more than 170,000 West African soldiers, many of whom end up fighting in the trenches of Western Europe. So, you know, think about that. Uh, imagine that you're somebody coming from sub-Saharan Africa, and here you are sitting in a nasty, dirty, cold trench, uh, likely to die in France, fighting on behalf of your colonial master. And really, you must be asking yourself, how on earth did I end up here? Uh, one thing for sure, many of them are really hoping to be rewarded after the war by being given at least some degree of autonomy, if not outright independence. And not just, you know, West Africans and Indians, but also Australians and New Zealanders who to some degree have been fairly autonomous. Uh, but, you know, many of them, you know, imagine you're an Australian or a New Zealander fighting uh, in the Middle East. And, you know, here you are thousands of miles away from home fighting the Ottoman Empire with whom you have no quarrel uh, on behalf of the empire. And, you know, this will become a major factor in uh, kind of, you know, inspiring a greater desire to become...
uh, fully independent, not part of the British Empire in any capacity. Uh, I have indicated here a, a very uh, significant campaign involving Australians and New Zealanders, a campaign in Gallipoli. Uh, it was kind of an attempt to take control of Constantinople or Istanbul. Uh, the idea that by landing, uh, you can see uh, at a point called Gallipoli, and you can see it at the, uh, in that map, uh, as indicated by the lower arrow, right, that if they could take that kind of thin strip of land and then march up and take out uh, Istanbul, they could knock the Ottoman Empire out of the war. So that was the British war strategy, but mostly involving Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, and it failed. It failed in large measure because the Turks were able to rally and kind of prevent uh, them from taking that strip of land. Uh, by the way, headed by a fellow named Mustafa Kemal, who, uh, later uh, who would be the founder of the Turkish Republic. Uh, but w the reason I'm mentioning this is, uh, so for instance, I actually visited Gallipoli. Uh, and, you know, you can see the, you know, there, there's kind of various uh, monuments indicating where some of the fighting took place. Uh, a lot of military cemeteries and, and not just many Turkish soldiers buried there, but many Australians and New Zealanders as well. I was very struck, uh, very much struck by the large numbers of Australians and New Zealanders who were visiting there. And I really quickly came to realize uh, that this campaign loomed very large in their national history as a kind of... Uh, turning point, if you will, in terms of how they thought about their place in the British Empire. In any event, you're probably thinking, well, gosh, uh, there's one country that I'm pretty sure was involved in the, in the First World War that hasn't made an appearance yet, and that would be the United States. Uh, and in fact, the United States will not enter the war until much later because uh, at the time that the war begins, there is a very strong isolationist sentiment in the United States, kind of a feeling that this is a European affair and we shouldn't get involved, but eventually drawn into the war in large measure because of the unrestricted warfare being conducted by Germany, where they're attacking civilian ships, uh, American ships, uh, and eventually the United States declares war in April 1917, uh, at that time headed by U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, but they, they aren't actually going to send troops until 1918, in large measure because up until that point, the United States had a very minuscule army, strictly on a volunteer basis. Uh, so they're going to have to actually implement a draft, round up large numbers of young men, train them, and then finally eventually ship them to Europe. And none too soon, because by 1917, Russia has been knocked out of the war uh, and the tide has begun, had begun turning in Germany's favor. Uh, obviously, the United States will be fighting on the side of the Allies. And in case you're wondering, uh, how did Russia get knocked out of the war? It has nothing to do with anything Germany did. It is because they will be undergoing a revolution. But before we get to the Russian Revolution, I want to say one last thing about uh, the uniqueness of the First World War, often considered the first case of what we call total war in the sense that it involved entire populations. Now, of course, first and foremost in the fact that you have huge conscri uh, conscripted armies, right? So every able-bodied young man having to serve in the war. Uh, eventually, this will even include Britain, where they finally introduce compulsory service. But not just uh, in that regard, right? It also has to do with the impact it has on civilians, the level of their involvement. Uh, this is very different from, say, you know, the United States war in Afghanistan or Iraq, where if you're not a soldier, you pretty much could ignore the fact that a war is taking place. Right. This is a very different kind of war, uh, certainly in some parts of the continent, uh, directly impacting civilian populations because the fighting is taking place uh, literally outside their home. Right. But but also in the sense that, for instance, civilians are now very active working in the factories to produce the munitions of war, you know, given the high level of technology involved. Uh, in some cases, industries and, and entire transportation systems will be nationalized in order to meet the demands of war. Uh, we're starting to see women working in the factories, right, working in jobs originally reserved for men. Uh, but, you know, other things as well, right? For instance, scientists devoting all their intellectual capabilities to developing weapons of war. Basically, every resource a country has devoted to the war effort. Uh, and also, very often, the idea that everyone is obligated to support the war. 
Uh, so, for instance, uh, even in Britain, dissent against the war increasingly not tolerated. The British pass the Defense of the Realm Act, DORA, which basically allows public authorities to arrest dissenters as traitors. Right? Now, you know, I'm kind of highlighting Britain because that is a country where up until then, uh, they really had considered it a very important political principle that people should be able to speak freely their conscience. Uh, but in this case, they decide, no, this would be unacceptable. In any event, this is uh, a good place to end the first part of our lecture. When we come back with the second part, we'll begin with the Russian Revolution.